Good afternoon, folks. And here's one of my favorite topics in science fiction that's always talking about the issues regarding the science aspect. The number one problem I've ever seen in science fiction is always time travel. And the second one is FTL, or traveling faster than the speed of light. And every science fiction story or space opera or any sufficient story in the future where you have space travel, where you're traveling faster than light, you have to deal with the concept of why aren't you using this technology as a weapon? And this has been explored recently, most recently in The Last Jedi. Uh, the lack of uh, lore and explanation as to why the entire galaxy hasn't been doing this since day one. And interestingly enough, we have a similar problem in the first Mass Effect game as well as the second one. And it gets lampshaded finally in the third game, which is an interesting turn of events if you bother to read the codex. So this article on thegamer.com has to do with Edie becoming the deadliest SOB in space. And of course, it has to do with her being able to program a FTL drive to travel as a weapon. So there was a lot of talk about this from Chris Hepler about why they were going to use Edie. And they wanted her to be, uh, be able to break the safeties on these things. So you either needed a genius who could reinvent a Starship drive entirely or an unshackled AI at the wheel who could link, who could think like a Reaper. So that's not necessarily FTL, but just someone who could uh, challenge a Reaper. So um, here's the a few codex entries on the issue. And it's talking about how we have all these rules, like there's conventions by the Citadel. You can't use a large kinetic impactors, but that doesn't even come close to the speeds of FTL. You're just talking about dropping an asteroid on a planet and causing a large explosion that would decimate the ecosystem of the planet, which we sort of got in the DLC in Mass Effect, Bring Down the Sky. That was one of the plots you had to stop that from happening. So they have addressed this in the game in some fashion. Um, the actual codex entry came from Mass Effect 3, though, in the Reaper War called Desperate Measures. Here we have uh, in the belief that starships are too costly to be used as projectiles, given that it would take many collisions to seriously harm a Reaper. Some armchair admirals suggest that a single starship traveling faster than light could obliterate a Reaper capital ship. And there's some YouTube videos about that. It is almost a guarantee. Like there's, uh, with that, whatever concept in lore you want to address. But if you could take out a Reaper with uh, four slugs, from a dreadnought or dreadnought class ship from the Alliance, then you wouldn't even need to get close to FTL to worry about that. But if you had such a weapon, you wouldn't need a ship. You would just need the FTL drive itself, and anything approaching close to light speed would be perfectly fine. For example, uh, remember the famous quote, as per the title of the article, the. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton is, de is the deadliest son of, a, son of a bitch in space that we heard in Mass Effect 2. So an Everett-class dreadnought accelerates 1 to 1.3% of light speed. It impacts the force of a 38 kiloton bomb. So light speed is almost 300,000 kilometers a second. So 1 to 1.3% of that is almost 4,000 kilometers a second. Nothing compared to approaching light speed. And just to put that into consideration, let's say you have one kilogram mass traveling at 99% of the speed of light. Because again, according to, to physics, it's impossible to hit the speed of light if you have mass because you would need an unlimited amount of energy to do so. So you would have the kinetic energy of a whole lot of joules. <laughs> I won't read that out. Uh, it would be equal to 132 megatons of TNT. Okay, 132 megatons. If you want to know what a megaton is, or a, let's say a, a kiloton of TNT, that's a 1,000 tons of TNT, the explosive force. A kiloton is a million tons of TNT, so a 1,000 times more than a kiloton. You would not need anywhere near that level to destroy a Reaper. Remember, to destroy a Reaper, you need one of two things, canes or fleets. Those are your two options for defeating a Reaper. You could argue the Thanix missiles, if they ever work, or the Thanix cannons. Yes, sure. But this is the thing we actually know that works. 
So you wouldn't even need to go close to a to that level of power. But that's the problem. So the, the codex sort of kind of lampshaded, and here it is. Because this is not a perfect safety feature because Mass Effect technology possesses hardwired safety features to prevent FTL collisions. So the actual design, the software designed in the FTL drive prevents it from being used whenever there's a potential collision. Now, I don't know how they detect that. I'm not sure how they, uh, they scale that up or down to have like a laser that shoots out faster than light and bounces back even faster to tell you, yeah, you're safe to go to FTL. Uh, kind of curious, but okay. Maybe it's constantly scanning for objects in front of it. That'd be interesting to see how that works. So the FTL drive has a safety feature built in to prevent it from doing so. And the idea thus becomes that ED would be smart enough to override that safety feature. Although it doesn't seem like you need a, a super smart AI to do that. You would just design an FTL drive that would be able to do it. So that's the interesting thing about Mass Effect. It has actual FTL and it has faster than light gates. The difference is the Mass Effect relays create massless corridors that tra have objects travel excessively fast, almost instantly. And because there's nothing that the, the object weighs and there's nothing in its way, you're never going to hit anything and there's no worry about that. Even if you were to use a, a massless corridor with a non-massless object, it would just pass right through because you're in a massless corridor, which is kind of the concept of Mass Effect 2, which kind of broke the lore, but eh, Vanguard Charge is, is very fun to play. So uh, Chris Helper goes on to explain that Edie would be the only one who could, do this, could pull this off, and they were thinking around of having Edie and Joker doing a sacrifice, the, the Normandy, and uh, blow away Harbinger or whatever, which sounds dramatic and cool, but that, no, it's probably not a very good idea. We'll just use uh, normal means of fighting. So FTL weapons are an interesting problem in science fiction because they, this, any star drive that can get you anywhere, interesting, can also be used as a relativistic weapon that hits with the force of hundreds of nuclear bombs. And if you guys want to know, there's a giant list of them. This is just a small one. So you have uh, P.K. Dick. You have Josh Whedon. You've got oh, all sorts of writers over the years. I'd say the past 70 years that I've been doing this are Ursula K. Le Guin. There we go. And if you want to read one, here's one by PKD. The Variable Man is a short story. It's not too long. Just uh, about 20 pages or so, maybe more. Maybe more than 20 pages. <laughs> but it's all free online because this is like a 70-year book. So this, is, this has been in science fiction for a long time and... Mass Effect sort of lampshaded in a codex entry because we all just guess stuff. So we learned that in Mass Effect 2, as I said before, fires a slug at 1% the speed of light, roughly. Hits with the force of several nuclear bombs. So an FTL craft would do a heck of a lot more damage just because there's more mass. The multiplier is, is mostly the speed as opposed to the mass, but having a mass to start off is not a big deal. Uh, you, come, you come to problems with, with energy. How do you get that fast? Um, how do you how do you have a drive or a corridor to launch something like a barrel that big? But it seems you don't need that big of a gun or big of a, of a payload to launch at a Reaper to blow it away. So this is also what we talked about in The Last Jedi, how it, Lucasfilm was always abided by the rule of cool. So uh, not the greatest form of hard science fiction to make sense of how the world works, especially when you break the lore in the process when there's not much hard science fiction to begin with. So nobody takes out the Death Star with an X-Wing because that wouldn't be very cool. I think it would be very cool, but it would break the entire concept of Star Wars or any science fiction for that matter. So you always have to limit your technology, whether it's sci-fi, science fiction, magic, mysticism, doesn't matter what lore what genre in, you got to follow Brendan Sanderson's second rule. You have to limit the magic of your lore. Oh boy. So uh, 
Hepler also wrote Cerberus Daily News. He talked about a terrorist who used a certain speed, not light speed, to crash uh, into a uh, terrorist city at a few thousand miles per hour, which is essentially what the, the dreadnought ships fire at. And ba-boom, this was a huge problem and all weaponizations were destroyed because that would upset the balance in the galaxy. So we have the technology. We've had the weapons to, to annihilate Reapers. We've always done it. We have just haven't done it because they're too dangerous. And the lore contradicts all the stuff with the Thanix cannon. We didn't need the Thanix cannon. We just needed our fleets to just ramp up the speed of how we we directed those uh, those slugs, even a even a five percent increase. If it takes four shots to take out a reaper, one shot would have done it. If it was five percent speed, the speed of light, with the same payload. So this was all short sighted, considering that reapers were coming. But politically, the right thing to do for a grieving Turian population. That's the council for you. So here we go. We blame the council for everything. It's all because the council wouldn't allow certain weapons technology to be deployed because they could wipe out a city. Considering all life in the galaxy is about to be wiped out, uh, the rules of engagement have changed. But unfortunately, the council has not. So it goes on and on, but uh, that's the the main argument I wanted to say. And uh, to have ED go out with Joker losing the Normandy would be pretty pretty tragic, but also pretty ridiculous, especially during the... (laughs) The scenario in London where the Normandy comes down and saves your your squad mate that that would have annihilated all life on the planet probably. But you know, <laughs> we do that anyway in the destroy ending. So uh, yeah, huh. or the bad destroy ending rather. So I guess they got some aspects of uh, galactic annihilation through faster than light travel. Anyway, thanks for listening, folks. Have yourself a great day.